everybody, welcome back to Numerical Techniques for Electromagnetics. Uh, this will be our final section for the semester in which we discuss the method of moments, which is kind of a, a general expansion on that inverse process we talked about in the previous lessons. Now, before we get too deep into what the method of moments is, it's going to help to frame it in terms of a, uh, a familiar electrostatic problem. So I'd like to begin by reviewing Coulomb's law a bit, just to sort of set the stage. So recall that if I have a point charge, say Q, over here at the origin, right? So I have some x, y axis here, x and y, like so. And I have an observation point over here. So we'll draw a vector like so, r indicating the uh, the position coordinates over here. So you might write this as x comma y. Or you could write this as r equals x, x hat plus y, y hat. So what does Coulomb's law state? Well, Coulomb's law says that phi of r is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times q over the magnitude of r like so. And usually we don't necessarily have to write it out in a full vector notation. We oftentimes will write this as just q over r, but just keep in the back of your mind that r is the magnitude of r, like so. <clears throat> so that's all fine and dandy and very familiar. Uh, but what happens if we complicate things just a little bit? For example, suppose that my charge is not centered at the origin. Okay, so I still have a charge floating out here in space somewhere, but my origin is, say, over here. Okay, so here's my x and my y, like so. So that means there is a, another vector, this vector here. So let's draw it like so. I have a vector here, which I'm going to call r prime, indicating the position of the source. And this vector here, r, has to now become a vector pointing from the origin like so, to my observation point. So there's my r, I have an r prime, like so. And then the vector pointing from here to here, you would write this as r minus r prime, or it might actually point that way. Uh, <laughs> it's easy to get those backwards, okay? So we care about this particular distance here, like so. So nothing's fundamentally changed, just our reference of where the origin is. So it should make perfect sense to rewrite Coulomb's law as something like the following. One over four pi epsilon naught, and I'll say Q over the magnitude of R minus R prime. So that just indicates that this is the distance we care about, but my origin is over here somewhere. Okay, so that should be all fun and familiar, but let's add one extra layer of complexity to this. Suppose I have, say, a coordinate origin up here. So there's my x and my y. I have an observation point, say, here. So let's just indicate that with a little dot, like so. And I have multiple charges just floating out here in space, like so. So I might write this as q1, q2, you know, q3, qn, right? Q, 3, Q4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and N, okay? And they can just be all over the place. So N collections of point charges. Here is my observation point here. So remember, this vector here, I'm going to call that R. And all these other vectors, from here to here, this would be R1 prime. And then I have another vector, oops, sorry, going to here. Call that R2 prime. And then there's an R3 prime, Rn prime, like so, Rn prime, and just a bunch of these source vectors, okay? <clears throat> so then we would write simply phi of R is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. And remember, the scalar potential at this point here is a linear combination of all the individual contributions. So I just write this as n equals 1 to, in, or sorry, not to infinity, <laughs> to n, like so. And I would say q sub n, little n, divided by r minus r prime sub n, like that. So you notice we're just adding up the individual little contributions. 
Okay, that's fine and dandy, should be totally familiar and simple, but let's add yet one more layer of complexity to this situation. Okay, so you'll notice now I've replaced all of those individual little point charges with a blob of continuous charge density, which we denote with the, the Greek letter rho here. Okay, so again, we have an origin out here and some arbitrary point somewhere inside of this volume here, which we're gonna denote with a V prime. So here's some arbitrary source point, R prime within that volume. And I could have, again, an observation point out here somewhere, or it could be over here or over here, or I could even have it inside this charge distribution and there would still be some scalar potential to correspond to that. So the next question is just how do I extend this to reflect a situation like this? And the basic insight is to remember that nothing really fundamentally changes. The electric scalar potential at this point right here, so we'll write this as V of R, it's still just a superposition of all the individual little contributions from all these little points. The only thing that really changes is that this uh, summation has to be infinite. Okay, there's infinitely many tiny itty bitty little contributions from this uh, charge distribution here, and I just need to add them all up. So that's where the language of calculus is so powerful is that this little summation here just needs to get replaced with some sort of integral. And since this is actually over a volume, you would write it as a triple, triple integral of some kind, right? So let's just write that right now. So you start by imagining here is uh, the, my observation point here. And I want to ask, what is the contribution from say, a tiny little differential piece of my blob here? So you would just say something like the differential contribution to the scalar potential at the point R would be one over four pi epsilon naught times dq. So there's some differential charge located in that tiny little volume and it would be r minus r prime, like so. So what is the differential charge here? Well, that's simply the charge density, rho of r prime times dv prime, okay? So there's a differential volume times some charge density, which you could also imagine being rho of r prime times dx dy dz, like so. So charge density times volume gives me charge, and it's a differential volume, there's a differential charge. So then the total scalar potential here will just be the infinite summation of all of these little differential contributions. So you just integrate that whole thing over all the points where there is some non-zero uh, charge, right? So what you basically get is this simplifies now to phi of r is equal to one over four pi epsilon naught times the triple integral evaluated over this volume here, V prime. You just say rho of R prime divided by R minus R prime times dV prime. <clears throat> and there you go. So you notice there's nothing conceptually really different between these two expressions here. It's just, this is kind of an infinite summation of infinitesimal contributions. Whereas this one over here is just a finite summation over finite little discrete contributions. But the idea is essentially the same. So this is Coulomb's law in kind of a more general sense for blobs of charge distributed throughout space. And this is gonna be our springboard here because we figured out how to invert equations that kind of look like this and have this form, where I say this was known, but this is the thing I want to calculate. But what I want to do is expand that to situations maybe like this, where this is known, but this is now the thing I maybe want to calculate. And so the idea is more or less the same. We just have to kind of figure out how to take care of this infinite continuum of charge density. And that's going to be our springboard for understanding the method of moments.